Jeff Whitehead interviews Jesus on the subject of sole causes of physical illness. The interview took place in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia, on the 5th of October, 2012. Yes, now, um, this is a fourth in interview with AJ, and I noticed the last interview with Luli, she didn't say Jesus, <laughs> uh, with Jesus or AJ, or whatever you like to think. Um, I've had three interviews now, and uh, I keep coming back for more. Um, this interview, I thought we would talk about something that you've mentioned on various seminars, incidentally, yep. um, about illness being an indication that something might be going on with you spiritually. Yep. Um, and I come at this from a personal experience mm -hmm. in that for me, um, my sister is here with me today and I visited my sister one time after going down to a, a masseur down on the coast and she was massaging my stomach and she said, you have this emotion stored here and this emotion stored here and this emotion stored here. And before I knew it, I was crying. Yeah. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> and uh, and so I went to Dell's place and I spoke a few, about a few things and the same thing. I, these emotions were like coming out and it was like I was bursting. It was like something that was so tight, ready to explode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I had suppressed a lot of, or denied a lot of emotions and that they were taking their toll on my body. Mm -hmm and I got celiac disease and I got Bell's palsy mm -hmm. because I couldn't come to grips with these and I thought well maybe there's something in here in this and mm. this is three years before I met you and then mm. you saying the same thing I thought well there's, there may be something here mm. um, so can we use our health as a guide to our emotions or our spirituality is it, is it a direct reflection it's a wide open question, that one, isn't it? The, I suppose if we're going to answer that question, we've got to understand what are all of the key factors that play a part in our health, physical health. And there are things, um, there are quite a number of things that play a part in our physical health. Many of the things that play a part, we're not on this planet yet completely aware of, unfortunately. Many of the things that play a part are spiritual in nature, in the sense that they involve people who have passed over into the spirit world, who are still connected to the earth, and so and so we have we have very many contributing factors that cause our own imbalance in health. Now, the primary cause is uh, and and. Like my personal feeling is that the primary cause has to do a lot with, with walking away from God and walking away from that relationship because of all the things that that relationship would have taught us. But if we take God out of the equation, there are still quite a lot of contributing factors that cause a lack of health in, a, in, a physical, in our physical body. There are, there are firstly our own stored locked up emotions that we have not allowed the release of, uh, as you mentioned in your introduction often they're like a sort of a powder keg ready to explode mm -hmm. and all we need is some kind of trigger for, for those particular emotions to explode. Now normally um, when a person experiences the loss of a loved one for example that's, that, that is a big enough trigger for many people that all of these unhealed emotions that have been stored in us for many, many, often many decades mm -hmm. have, are now come and flow out of us. For, for others, it, once you become a bit more sensitive emotionally, um, often it's only just the physical touch that might trigger the experience of the emotion. It just depends on how long the emotion has been stored in the body and how long we've been holding onto it and what readiness we have emotionally and psychologically to actually release it. Because many of the times we're in a lot of denial about the emotion being present and we have no desire psychologically to release it and so it just stores and stores and stores in, inside of our body. Now every emotion is stored inside of our body, is stored generally in a certain location. Um, so there, there are people now who have done much research who understand that certain types of emotions affect certain what, what are called chakras of your spirit body. And when those chakras of your spirit body start closing down energetically, 
they affect your physical body in that particular location. And so there are certain major centers in our spirit body that start closing down due to our emotional condition. And then because of the lack of energy flowing through our spirit form and into our physical form, our physical form starts showing over a period of time the degradation of the emotional condition of the spirit body. So it, it, the, the physical body though takes around seven years to respond in, in, its, in the longest cell sense. So, so it could be seven years later that we start seeing a effect, an effect in the spirit in the physical body that has already begun seven years prior in our spirit form or, or in our soul, if you yeah, like. Well, this woman said, what happened three years ago? Mm. And I said, ah, oh, that's, yeah, yeah that, okay, that's when that happened, you know? Okay. And uh, she said, it usually takes about three years to take, have this effect yes. that it's had now. Yes. And it can be anything up to seven years, as I say, before we start having an effect. And, and, and we may not even then feel the emotion. It might be just that it starts having a physical effect on our body. Mm. And, and the more we deny the emotion, the stronger generally the physical effect becomes. And the longer period we deny it, the, the more uh, larger the issue and problem becomes until it turns into some kind of disease-based uh, problem. So this is where cancers and, and heart disease and these other forms of diseases that come up are generally caused over very, very long periods of denial of a specific emotion. And, uh, and every single part of your body is connected to this energetic structure. So, and the emotion drives the, the energy structure. So if your emotion isn't flowing, and you are holding it tightly, then the emotion being held tightly, wherever it's being held, will have an effect in that particular area of the body and therefore will have a large effect on your life. Not only that, um, your emotion also causes what you attract. So now the law of attraction is also operating, so any accidents that you may have are actually related to different emotions as well. So the physical health of our physical body is now dependent upon the things that we've got locked up in our soul, if you like, that have an effect on both our spirit form and our physical form, and these particular things automatically begin showing themselves over a period of time, the more we deny them, they show themselves in our physical body in, in long-term disease issues with our body or illnesses, and also what happens with regard to accidents. So this is obviously the two major causes of most of our discomfort in our body, mm. is a direct result of the shutting down of our emotional system. And getting back to what you should have said about chakras. I saw in one seminar there was a confrontation with you and another fellow who said he was an expert and he'd, go, he'd been around the world teaching about chakras and you've got it wrong. Yeah. And you were arguing, or the, he was arguing about the number of chakras. When I first heard about chakras I was exploring new age philosophy and yep. at about the age of 24 and the chakras thing, I thought, oh, this is too much for me and I left. Yep. I didn't get the chakras and an energy, so can you explain that a little bit more? Well, there, there are energy circulations that occur around our spirit body's form, which are driven by the soul in its condition. But these energy flows have intersection points where they cross over. The points of the largest crossovers in a person who is not on the divine love path, but on the natural love path, uh, there are seven of those crossover points in the, in the body. And these are crossover points. I think it's 192 crossover points in every one of the seven chakras. But the first, the, the, the seventh is the crown chakra, the sixth is the eye, the fifth is the throat, the fourth is the heart, the third is the diaphragm area, second is like the belly, but just under the belly button area, and then the first is at the base, or, you know, at the pubic base. And, and those are the major energy points of crossover in that occur in the spirit in the spirit form. Now they're not the only energy crossover points. They're just the ones that are major. Okay. We have other energy crossover points in our physical body. For example, our ears are very very much sensitive to crossover points of energy. Our hands, our feet. You know the soles of our feet, the palms of our hands. And um, so there are many more energy crossover points in our body. The main seven chakras that are referred to refer to those major energy crossover points that I've just referred to. 
if you're on the divine love path and you begin uh, progressing on the divine love path, once you become at one with God, you actually gain more crossover points in, in the way in which the spirit body operates because of that's driven by the energy that's coming from the soul. And so there is a, the, the, the further you progress spiritually, the more energy crossover points you will finish up having and you will have more than the seven basic chakra points that the, 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 the average person has uh, on the planet or in, in the spirit world. Can you start to progress in this healing of, of getting these energy points working more effectively? Can you start to get that working before you're at one with God? Or like you said in the, in the first century that you noticed when you, were, um, when you first discovered healing, um, this, was, this was not when you had decided that you were at one with God. No. And you can, you can aid your system greatly through what you discover, but you must understand the linkage between the emotion, the point of love that the emotion is displaying, or the lack of love, and the actual physical part in your body that's being affected, because there is a link, a direct link between each of those things. And I feel that for most people, when they start looking at healing their spirit body, they don't decide to discover those things. What they do instead is generally they may lay on a table, somebody may get their chakras moving by operating their chakras in a, in a clockwise rotation and open up the person from a chakra perspective and that can help the energy flow certainly at the time the person is doing it. The problem is that we very rarely ask the question of why it's shut down in that location in the first place. And this is where I feel the majority of people are not putting their energy. What we have a tendency to do on the planet is we have a tendency to focus on the curing of an ailment mm. without ever seeing what caused the ailment in the first place. So for example, we are focused on curing cancer without really knowing its underlying cause. You know, We're looking for a physical cause when the actual cause is to do with an emotion. And because we are denying the actual cause, we are looking for something that is physical in nature that will actually cure us and, and this is what many people do who are involved in metaphysics. They're just looking at the physical at a different level. And the different level they're looking at it is the metaphysical rather than just the physical. But they're still looking at a physical effect rather than being able to see the actual cause. And one of the things that I've been teaching everybody with regard to everything that we ever need to face in our life is that we need to look at the cause rather than the effect. And you might have seen that talk that I gave about causes versus effect. Mm. And, and I feel when it comes to our physical ailments, this is one of the areas that we're looking mostly at effects and mostly at fixing the effects. Mm. We, we are very resistive to the concept that there is a cause within us that's emotional in its nation, nature that has something to do with love that is actually the cause of this problem. If, if you can imagine, um, for those people that do believe in God, if God, is a, if, if God is a purely loving being, then God would have created, a, if God's got the capacity to create this intensely um, complex system, then God would have created the, it with the ability to heal itself. And we can see this occurs on a daily basis. Most of us carry around bacteria and viruses inside of our body that could potentially kill us, but they don't. And the reason why is because our body maintains a system where everything is being cured on a daily basis generally until some kind of energy system is upset. So, so we need to acknowledge that, that there is this ability of our own body to maintain its own health. Once we acknowledge that, then we've got to make the next step, which is if I am out of health or I have an accident of some kind, some kind of accident, then I must acknowledge that there must be something inside of me emotionally, some other cause other than physical in nature, that has caused these accidents or these illnesses to occur. Because under normal circumstances, they do not occur. They shouldn't have happened. They shouldn't have happened. And, and under normal circumstances, our body is this self-correcting system. So, so there's got to be something that's causing the disharmony. And, and if we understand that God is a God of love, then we'll begin to make the link between love being the cause or a lack of love being the cause of all disharmony and love being the cause of all harmony. So that being said, if we look at our body now, every time our body goes into an illness, 
we need to see it as okay the illness is demonstrating that my body's fighting something it's in a lack of harmony there's no harmony there so there's got to be some issue of love involved here with this particular disease or illness um, now one of the first things you tend to do is you ask people is it on the left side or the right side mm -hmm. so you obviously uh, um, believe that is it the left side is the feminine and the right side is the masculine so it has to do with either issues with our parents on that side or masculinity or feminine issues yes but it's a bit more complicated than that unfortunately um, because uh, as you can imagine with any complex system it is going to have complicated things that affect it for example if something could be happening to the left side of your body that is about your masculinity mm -hmm. if you're a male but it's about how your masculinity is expressed to the feminine. Mm. Does that make sense? Rather than being necessarily about femininity. Um, so, so there are relationships inside of our body that we do need to understand. And, and many of these have already been quite well documented in, mo in most Eastern philosophies and also in most Eastern um, forms of medicine. Uh, have some fairly well documented issues with regard to the left right side of the body the different locations of our body what particular areas of our body those main crossover points and do you go along with all of that like you know oh. they, they map out parts of the, the sole of your foot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. people map out parts of your hand and iridology do you go along with all of that or sure or yes i do um, the majority of it is able to be proven that there are linkages between for example with the feet with reflexology there is a linkage between certain parts of your feet and certain internal organs for example the same goes with your ears and relationship between pressure points in your ears and certain internal organs with regard to your eyes your eyes are as i said in the first century a mirror of the soul mm. they are a complete reflection of everything emotionally that's going on inside of the soul the the energy points of your hands or all these crossover points do have specific emotions involved in them i just don't agree with how people then interpret that so so i do agree that each one of these things is a complete reflection of what is going on in your entire system but but i feel it's that the lack of information surrounds the soul the relationship between the emotions and what is being created so so i've seen people lay on a table and be spiritually healed you know in one week sort of uh, you know they have some spiritual healing they feel really good when they get off the table they feel like that pain has gone in that particular area of the body they walk out of the door three days later they're back in the same pain and you've got to ask the question well obviously something happened while they were being spiritually healed otherwise they would have still experienced the pain but why is it that three days later they have the pain back and the only answer can be that the actual cause wasn't addressed mm. that it was just an effect being addressed and this is where i feel the, is the main problem with regard to most medicine today we're dealing with effect effect after effect after effect as we are in many of the other aspects of our life as well mm. you know if you look at politics religion and many of the other main areas of our life you can see we're still addressing effects law we're still addressing effects we need to start addressing the cause of, the, of these particular problems, which all start or begin in the soul, and it all starts and begins in the soul out of harmony with love, basically, or with God's viewpoint of love. Now, for, for example, a lot of people then ask me, well, you know, what happens with children then, you know? Who's out of harmony with love there? Surely a child is more in harmony with love than an adult. But there is not the understanding about the transference of emotions from adults to children mm -hmm. and the transference of emotions from the environment into a person. How we treat a person does cause emotions to be generated within the person that then cause, and then how we treat those emotions. We often shut down those emotions and that causes the person to shut down the flowing energy-based system that is working. And of course they begin to get diseases and, and sicknesses as a result. So we need to have more of a study on the actual soul, the effect of the emotion in regard to love, in or out of harmony with love, and how that affects the soul, and the suppression of emotion, and then how that causes effects in the spirit body and in the physical body that, it, that it, you know, and this, this applies whether we are dead, as the saying goes, you know, because we just don't have a physical body, but still have a spirit body. 
So every person in the spirit world is in the lower spheres of the spirit world. They do have physical illnesses still. They do get sick still. And the reason why is because the soul is still causing their sickness. It's, it's the soul's sickness. So in the spirit world, people still experience illness. Yes, yes. It's very rare for a person to not experience illness until they've reached the sixth dimension of the spirit world. So there's, a, there's this big concept that many spiritualists have that a person in the spirit world never gets sick anymore. And that's not true. They, get, they still get sick because they still have emotional disharmony in their soul mm. and that disharmony causes them physical problems. And, and sometimes when you have spirits come to speak with you, you'll find, you, you interact with them and you, they'll find, yeah, the way they describe it is, oh, I've got a great big hole down on this part of my chest or I've got a big hole across my groin here or, you know, I've got this big growth that's on my shoulder here and I can't seem to get rid of it. What's that caused by it? They start understanding that it must be caused by something. That, they, that they're not sure about. And when you start discussing with them about the soul causing these physical problems in the spirit body and the physical problems in the physical body, then they start grasping the relationship between the soul and the illness, the soul and the disease, the soul and the accident, because there is a relationship between every accident, every disease, every illness and the soul. Can there just be environmental factors, purely environmental, like, you know, sunburn you know is that an emotional affliction or is it just the fact that you spent too long out in the sun you know like my skin is probably uh older than somebody who lives further south because i did a lot of surfing yeah, yeah. um is, aren't they just environmental factors that make our skin prematurely age because of too much sun or well that's why we like to tell ourselves um but that is, that is a misunderstanding of the truth because if we, if we if we examine, for example, sunburn, there's got to be something in the soul that causes it. The reason why is this. God made the sun and God made your body. Now, surely God would have made, in the original instance, the two things completely compatible with each other. Yeah, but he made me for the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Otherwise, I'd have dark skin and more melanin. No, I don't agree. Um, I feel that God made us perfectly and the only thing that causes a distortion in the entire system is our own emotion, is, is what we do that's in or out of harmony with love. There are, what I've noticed myself is that when there are emotions regarding anger or fear in a person, there is a definite result with anything natural. So, so for example, if there's anger in a person, generally they get a lot more sunburn. Than, than, than a person who's not angry. And, and there has to, be, it has to be a relationship between anger and sunburn for that to have occurred. Now, now there is also a physical relationship between sunburn and, and water, in the sense that if your body, the more water your body has, the less prone it, inside of it, the less prone it is to sunburn. So there is also that physical relationship, which also makes sense to me, given that water can be manipulated by your feelings. So, the, the reality is that every single physical thing that occurs, including sunburn, is caused by something going on at the soul level. Once you become at one with God, you won't get sunburn. It's because you're now in harmony, love-wise, with everything that God has created. It's only our lack of harmony that causes the illness, disease, or whatever the physical problem or ailment or pain is. It's the lack of harmony with love that is the underlying trigger for every one of them. Now, the reason why most people don't want to believe that is because most people don't firstly want to accept that they're out of harmony with love. <laughs> Secondly, uh, many people do not want to go down this road of investigation of relationship between an emotion and a physical ailment or problem. And thirdly, uh, it's generally uh, criticized by the medical profession, such a relationship, and so therefore most people are not willing to experiment with it. No, the medical profession, like I looked up, after looking at your talk on iridology, I looked up, I took a photo of my eye, mm -hmm. and uh, my kid's eyes, and the iris, and I had a, 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 I blew it up on the computer, so mm -hmm. it looked really good. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I googled, and they said there's no medical evidence that um, these spots in your iris have anything to do with your health. Um, and mm -hmm. a lot of doctors in the medical profession mm -hmm. would just say, Oh, this is just quackery. Yeah, but then again, if you go to a lot of the naturopathic part of the profession, 
who have had just as many years experience generally in looking at these particular things, they find a direct correlation between a certain person with a certain spot in their eye and a certain location that affects a certain physical part of their body and they can see that direct relationship and in fact once they start to attempt to address that particular problem that they, they firstly ask the person the, the patient you know do you have a problem in this area of your body and they go oh yeah I do mm -hmm. so there has to be some relationship between it because uh, because otherwise every single time they looked in the eye and asked the patient they know nothing about the patient many times they don't know anything about the patient's medical history many times mm -hmm. uh, except by looking in their eye firstly and then they're telling them they're all their entire physical problem or history sickness wise and illness wise and the majority of it is correct. So you've then got to start questioning, well, maybe there is some kind of correlation. Just because uh, nobody on the planet agrees with me or agrees with it, it doesn't mean it's not true. <laughs> you know? So when I got the Bell's palsy and it shut down this side of the face, mm -hmm. my right side, yeah. shut, shut it down for three months. Yeah. Um, they put it down to the herpes zoster virus right. infecting the seventh cranial nerve. Yeah. Um, which is the physical potential which is the physical, physical cause. side of it. Certainly. But being on my right side, you would say that's related to some masculine issues or... Um, yes, and particularly some... in this case, the suppression of masculine issues in favour of the feminine. So su suppression of yourself as a male, your ability to speak up, your ability to express yourself in feminine company. Is in feminine company? I would have thought it would have been in, in male company. Exactly. <laughs> he does this all the time. <laughs> well, see, can you see though, it's interesting because um, in some ways you believe yourself to be more comfortable with women than men, yes? Mm. The reality is that is not the case. And uh, why not? Well, because there is this underlying favoritism, favoritism that you have towards women, and this causes you to treat women with more deference and and uh, respect and concern than you would a male. Mm, that's so, that, true. so, and don't forget, the male is you. So you're willing in in feminine company, you're willing to put the woman above yourself. You're willing to do what the woman wants rather than do what you want, and so forth. And this causes a suppression of the masculine. Does it make sense? Mm. And so, even though you feel you're in, you you feel that you're uh, more um, relaxed in feminine company, the reality is that you're giving more of yourself and suppressing more of yourself in feminine company than you would be in masculine company. Mm. Well, I've never been able to relate to the yobbo Australian male who goes down to Bathurst and drinks beer. Yeah. And goes fishing and hunting, you know, that's... Uh, I can relate to that. Hey? <laughs> you can relate to it. Yeah, not the fishing and the hunting, but, <laughs> you know, I understand him going to Bathurst and watching, the, watching it for a thousand k's. Yeah. And I feel a lot of that is, uh, you know, there's some of that obviously that is based on, you know, certain emotions that they're, tr that, that they're trying to, that they have the opportunity to express when they're watching something like that. You see, I don't know if you've noticed, but the average Australian male does have a lot of difficulty expressing emotion in normal polite company, with the exception perhaps of the motion of anger. But when he goes to somewhere like Bathurst or you know the 500, 500cc motorcycles at Phillip Island or, or some other thing like that, he's now got the ability to express his emotion and his enthusiasm and his desire, his passion, and even cry about it without anybody laughing at him. And uh, so this gives him a sense of freedom that he can be himself in the company of other males, all you know, having this sort of mateship relationship through some kind of external mechanism. Mm. And so I completely relate to why they would be doing such a thing. And in fact, in some ways, it's more pure than, than some other relationships. Um, and, and so if you look at the relationship between many of the things we choose to do, we choose to do it because of what we're not allowed to do in our normal day-to-day -day life, generally. So a man, a man normally can't jump up and down on his, on his couch under normal circumstances in enthusiasm for his own life mm -hmm. but he can jump up and down on the couch he's allowed to do that when he's barracking for his favorite footy team or on an oprah winfrey show uh, <laughs> with his wife yeah he can't do it on an oprah winfrey show <laughs> but he's allowed to do it with his footy team right 
And this is, uh, you know, this is one of the problems that we face as males is that we have, we have created uh, construction, emotional construction of emotional limitations that are placed upon us under certain circumstances that we're allowed to get away with under different circumstances. Mm. And, uh, and this is one of the reasons why as men we gravitate towards sport because we can, we're allowed to express our emotions in a sporting environment that we would not normally be allowed to, even with our own wives under normal circumstances. I've heard you talk about um, people, uh, the Australian male has a, a lot of, uh, I see them very resistive to expressing their emotions and uh, especially sadness uh, when it comes to grief or the loss of somebody. Mm -hmm. And you've connected that in the past with heart problems. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so Remember that every emotion that we have is felt in primarily in a certain area. For example, with our heart, this is the area of love. This is the area of loss as well. You know, this is where we experience a lot of our loss or love-based pain. In the area of our diaphragm, this is where we experience a lot of our fear. So when people feel sick with fear, often that's where they, they feel sick properly. and they can't breathe properly and they can't, you know, they even go into hyperventilation and, and you know, panic attacks and all that, often uh, based around the source in that area of the tummy. If, if you look at worth, that's now down in the next chakra is, that is mostly. So when people start to feel a lack of self-worth and I, they feel self-attacking and all those kind of things, generally there's where their pain is in this area across just just above the genitals in that area of the stomach. And, and each area of your body, uh, another example is your throat area is often about expressing truth, uh, often about are you allowed to live in harmony with truth or not. So the different areas of your body have specific links to different emotional responses. And this is why we get different emotional responses in males and females with different illnesses. We have a different level of uh, sicknesses in males and females with different issues and it's all because of the different uh, ways in which we express our emotion and where the emotion is allowed to be stored, mm -hmm. where we physically finish up storing our emotion that affects our, our physical form. And so if we understand that everything that we do, sickness-wise, everything from the tip of what happens in the tip of our head, you know, from greying hair or, or going bald right the way down to what happens in the sole of our feet is all related to some kind of emotional response something going on that's out of harmony with love then we would begin to scientifically investigate the linkages mm. unfortunately because uh, many of the much of the medical profession debunks it before they even begin mm. um, then there is very little scientific investigation about these issues and, and unfortunately, when you don't have good scientific investigation, then you only have scientific investigation in an area that people are allowed to investigate. So at the moment on the planet, with regard to the mainstream medical profession, they're only allowed to investigate the physical relationships, the physiology, if you like, of the relationship between the body and the illness. They're not allowed to investigate the emotional relationships. Mm. But interestingly, doctors who have investigated the emotional relationships have far more success yeah. with sorting out these physical you problems. Know, a teacher I at a school that I was working at uh, was diagnosed with MS. Mm -hmm. And her doctor did, so, did start to delve into her emotional history yeah. uh, for looking for... So he's obviously seen a connection between MS and uh, emotional trauma in the past. Yes. Uh, what would that connection be? Well, it is different for each person. Um, you know, multiple sclerosis involves, doesn't it, the eating away of the mylar? Is that uh, uh, the myelin? The uh, myelin in the brain? No. On the nerves. On oh, the nerve system, sorry. The nerves, yeah. yeah. And, and th this kind of an illness is very much related to fear. And this is why the doctor would have been looking for some kind of historical trauma mm -hmm. that would have caused her to store fear to such an extent that it would affect the physical functioning of her own body and its nervous system. A friend of mine has MS and her father was an alcoholic. Would that be a classic? Uh... It's very common because uh, often alcoholics, when they are alcoholics, cause, uh, you know, they often can be violent and they often express that violence towards their family in some way. Many children block it out. Mm 
many children in fact go out of their body physically even try to remove themselves they can't physically remove themselves so they go away from themselves they even tune out completely of the experience but the experience is still happening and this uh, heavy amount of uh, violent energy that is projected towards the child in particular under those circumstances causes the child to have quite large amounts of fear that they've got to release and the, on the planet at the moment, there is very little respect or, uh, or knowledge about how to actually release fear. So, um, but fear it causes many of our physical ailments and illnesses, the storage of in our body. Mm. So. Now, getting back to the throat issues, mm. um, interestingly enough, uh, our father had um, <coughs> throat issues when he was a young boy, about six, was mm. it six? No? Because there was a bully up the road. Mm -hmm. Every time he walked to school, he had to confront this bully. Yeah. Um, he was a fairly nervous boy. He had St. Vitus dance. Yeah, and while well, he was diagnosed with St. Vitus dance, he couldn't talk. His speech shut down, and he was he taken away from the Charters Towers down to Stanthorpe. Couldn't, couldn't move at all. Oh. He had to be put in a room in a house with no stimulus whatsoever. Mm -hmm. After several months, he started talking again. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's an extreme example of somebody who's become so afraid that they can't speak up for themselves, mm. and uh, and that causes a huge shutdown in this in the in the fifth chakra area of our of our spirit form, the emotion that I'm not allowed to say or feel what I feel or say what I feel, causes this area of our body to shut down, and and unfortunately it causes many ailments right the way through to things like um, problems with the um, thyroid and all sorts of other issues like that mm -hmm. um, are all often caused by this same kind of problem of fear, a fear of and, and terror of being yourself and speaking up for yourself. Mm. Yeah. And strangely enough, in the late 60s, as a high school teacher, he was at a fairly rough high school mm -hmm. and uh, he started to get the voice problems again. The, the throat affliction started happening again. And yeah. He went on three Valium a day and it was gone. <laughs> yeah. Which sort of uh, is an example, you know, because Valium, I know because I take some, yeah. it's a good thing to push those emotions aside for a while. And a great way to sort of feel quite relaxed and calm without having yeah. to worry about the world and what the world thinks and feels. Yeah, because yeah. I said to him, what happened after you start, started taking three Valium? He goes, gone immediately. <laughs> And it was like this wonder, you know, this wonder drug. Yeah. But you don't say that uh, you don't uh, obviously uh, advocate the, the taking of uh, such drugs. Of any drugs, really. No. Yeah. So Valium, Valium, I think out of, there's a lot of antidepressants on the market at the moment. Valium was probably one of the first. Yeah, I don't, and I don't system. feel Valium is classified as an antidepressant, really, is it? No, so it's more of a muscle relaxant. Yeah, it's more of a muscle relaxant. But and, uh, yeah, the the issue that we face with most of our of the you know medicine has a role and even physical medicine does have a role. I feel in term, particularly in terms of the prevention of a person's pain that that is, that is causing long term suffering, for example, then certain medicine may have a role. But we must understand that even long term pain is created by you know, the the ignoring of short term pain, and the ignoring of short term pain is created by the ignoring of some kind of emotion that triggered the pain. And we need to understand the relationship. Now, what I would have suggested for your father is to work through his issues with the bully. Um, and that would have meant, you know, having probably some crying to do about how he was treated. Mm. It would also meant that he would need to feel some fear because he probably had quite a lot of fear about being, you know, violently harmed. And uh, these kind of emotions, if you can assist the person to go through those emotions, they will never have that illness again. Mm. They will never have that problem again and they'll never have to take Valium. Now, a lot of people on the planet probably say, well, oh, it's easier to take the value. Mm -hmm. um, I don't agree with that because, because we, we are forgetting that we are not just a physical being. And if that's the case, when we pass into the spirit world and we're taking value, we are not going to be able to take value in the spirit world. There is no such uh, condition, of, uh, you know, no such get dad off drug available. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with that then becomes that the same emotion is still present without the physical solution. And that is causing a problem to the spirit body. And this is why many people who pass into the spirit world have large degrees of pain 
because they have avoided their pain on earth using some kind of physical method, you know, and right down to even alcohol, drugs, and some kind of other physical method. And, and what they do is that when those physical methods are no longer available to them, they still have the problem. So we're far better off resolving the problems. In Confronting it now. Yeah, and, and resolving the cause. Mm. If we resolve the cause, we won't have to worry about it ever again. Mm. That's the beauty of it. Like, you know, I grew up with severe illnesses. Every month I, uh, I would be sick. I grew up with uh, severe asthma. You know, I was often hospitalized with asthma. I had, had a number of different uh, things that caused me to be hospitalized with pneumonia. And, and I, I've been in and out of hospital right up to the age of 33 until I recognised the relationship between emotions and my, and my ailments. Mm. Once I recognise that relationship, I haven't been in a hospital since. So, you know, every single emotional problem that I had caused the, all of these physical ailments. So I don't take asthma and medication anymore. I don't get asthma anymore. I can go jogging with Mary now. I'm about nearly 50 years old. I go jogging with Mary. And I don't get asthma anymore. I used to get asthma after when I was when I was a child. I used to get it after running about 500 meters at the most. And mm. um, I don't uh, have incessant sickness one after the other after the other anymore. And um, and all of this is the direct result of working on emotions rather than trying to find some physical solution. I used to have terrible bouts of hay fever, and I used to be on constant medication for hay fever as a result. I don't take any hay fever medication ever, haven't done for the last 15 years. I work out in our property. In hay. In hay. <laughs> in hay. Whereas before, that would, that would put me in hospital. When I was a child, mm. if I ever worked with hay, I was in hospital every time. And, and I don't, that happens to me no more either. And that's a direct result of me having to work through, or me working through those. You were even emotions. saying even a grey hair. Yeah, I notice now if I have certain emotions, certain hairs of my, of my head will start turning grey. And then as I work through the emotion, I see the root of the hair turning back to the original colour. Mm. And this is like, my, like I, I've done this now for a long enough time to know the direct correlation between every single physical ailment and every, and every single emotion that I've found within myself that causes it. Mm. So, and even that right down to cuts on my body, you know, when I have an accident, there's always an emotion I had just before then that I was suppressing. Or, and, and whether that accident is a large accident or a small one or just a nick of the knife while I'm preparing food or whatever, there is always a reason for it every single time. Because normally what I'm finding now, the more and more I live in harmony with love, the more spatially aware I'm becoming. I'm much more aware of my environment and the dangers in my environment automatically are apparent to me. And whereas before, you know, you wouldn't even see them. And, uh, and so this is an indication of the relationship as well between the soul in harmony with love and then what happens with the physical body. So, so I feel there's a, if, if we understand that direct relationship, the relationship between the soul and what it creates in the spirit and physical bodies, then instead of focusing on fixing the effect in our spirit body or our physical body by using metaphysical techniques or physical medicinal techniques, we will always go back our, as our first port of call, we'll always go back to the soul. We'll always look at what's happening at the soul, what's happening in my emotional state, what's happening in my state, in sort of how I feel that's out of harmony with love, because that's what creates all of these problems. So what did you decide was responsible for the hair going grey? <laughs> well, what, what, I, what I found with grey hair for myself, um, and re, bear in mind as yet, I don't know, you know whether it's different for each person with different things. But I suspect that there will be some differences because each person is quite unique in their emotional experience. But I do, what I do notice generally with, with all persons that I meet, that if they have a certain illness in a certain area of their body of a certain type, of a certain nature in the, in the same location, it's a, there's like every single time I've yet to find it different, every single time it's always the same emotion. Mm. And so that tells me that our system was made very um, you know, precise and also there are precise uh, methods of diagnosis if we actually investigate the relationship between the soul and the physical bodies. Uh, the spirit and physical bodies because if you can meet 100 people with the same problem and, and identify every single time the same emotion as the cause 
then that tells me that that is very it's a very repetitive diagnosis and therefore uh, something that's able to be investigated and scientifically proven if we chose to with regard to the hair balding uh, i was there was a time in my life where i started losing my hair at uh, the top of my crown and that started uh, i started uh, as mary knows it started to get very very thin didn't it darling and um, and after a while i realized this was all about my lack of worth connection with God, in my connection with God, my feelings of my own worth in relationship with God. And once I started my, working my way through some of those emotions, my hair started to thicken up again uh, in, in the back. Uh, with regard to gray hairs, what I've noticed is it depends on what part of my body is and what's happening. So, so sometimes there's gray in my beard, Sometimes there'll be grey in the sides here of my, of my hair. And sometimes there's little bits of grey in the hair itself that appear. And each one of those have a different relationship to different emotions. That's what I've found anyway. So I have some patches that are more grey than other patches, for example, even in the same location, but on, on the feminine and masculine side. And I know straight away there must be a relationship between the feminine on that one compared to the masculine on the other and what, what's affecting the growth of, of the hair itself and the, the structure of the follicle that causes mm. it. And once I work my way through the issue, it, it goes away. So, so I know that, that you can work your way through an issue and it go away. Well, time is going to prove you right on this one, isn't it? <laughs> or wrong. Or wrong. <laughs> In what regard? Yeah. Well, a doctor would just say, oh, oh, it's aging. Don't worry about it, it's aging, you know. You, you get grey hair when you get old, but my brother who's three years older than me doesn't have any grey hair and I've got heaps. Yes. And my mother's got less than me and she's 83. So... Uh, and this is, a, this is an interesting th thing too, is we tell ourselves that it's, that it's something like we're aging. And, and the truth is we are aging. The, the whole of the world's population is currently aging. The question we've got to ask ourselves is why are we aging? Because even our aging has something to do with our soul-based emotions. You see, if you, look at, if you look at what happens in the first 21 years of our life in terms of cell reproduction, the cells seem to re reproduce with exactly the same elasticity, the, sa the same kind of tendency, stronger, generally stronger during that period of time where we're in the growth phase. And, uh, and in fact, scientists have yet to discover why we age. They do not know well, really why. Uh, they realise there's a tell gene. Tell me there's a shortening as we grow, that they'll look for some reason, we don't know. Well, they realise there's a gene that affects the process of ageing, but they don't understand why the gene gets turned on at mm. a certain time of our, of our life. Now, what I'm suggesting is the gene gets turned on because of different emotions. Mm. And if you don't have those emotions, you will not age. So what I'm suggesting is this cell reproduction process that continues over the, over the period of our first 21 to 28 years will just continue and therefore we will forever maintain, once we've worked our way through all of the emotions, we'll forever maintain an appearance that's from 21 to 28 years of age. Mm. And in fact, I believe quite strongly that any person who's older than that can, can approach that age again in terms of their physical appearance, not through some kind of plastic surgery or anything like that, but rather through this soul-based surgery, if you like, you know, mm. working through the soul issues. Now, some people might say, oh, look, AJ's getting this from his time as being a JW because the JWs <laughs> believe that um, you know that we, we shouldn't age. We shouldn't be aged. Is that true? Um, well, you know, all Jehovah's Witnesses know that they age, you know, and they die from old age. Many of them. So they, don't they, they believe that in this new world we oh, might be aging? Certainly, certainly they, they certainly do believe in the new world that they believe after Armageddon comes and after Jesus comes and, mm -hmm. and sorts out the wicked and establishes the kingdom of God on earth, then they believe that after that time there will be no ageing. By the way, the Bible does suggest that, so they do, they mm -hmm. do believe in what the Bible says on that matter. And my feelings are that if you look historically at, uh, at things, you can see that there is no reason why we age that there's no physical reason that we've been able to identify aside from this particular gene as to why we do age. Our body seems to replicate itself fine up until a certain age and then, then the ageing process seems to begin. There is, there is also historically records from history that would tend to suggest that mankind have lived shorter and longer lives than what we currently do. 
say, you know, in the Bible itself, there's a re there's records of people living 900 years, for example. Well, wouldn't they have just been counting the moons rather than the, the sun? Well, that's somebody's explanation, but I'm sure they were just as intelligent as we are and uh, would have counted their time the same. But, you know, we can come up with alternate explanations if we want. I believe the alternate explanation is that is that the reality is God created us to not age. We don't have to age. Um, that would seem out of line <laughs> with everything else around us, like trees. Trees um, just die. And yeah, but trees are not a good example, Jeff. They live 2,000 years or more. Oh, that's so. Uh, you got me. <laughs> you know, a tortoise lives 200. Yes. You know, uh, so, you so know. There is a 3,000-year-old tree. There are 3,000-year-old trees. There are tortoises 200 years old, and this would tend to indicate that mammals are capable of living a lot longer than we currently live. Would that not be the case if there are living creatures? And, and they do eventually die. It's like I've always seen the life and death as just a natural part of the way the universe is designed. Yes, and I, and I don't see it like that. And however, can I put some logic toward, to, to, to this particular puzzle, if you like? If, uh, when, when we look at this issue of whether we die or not, you know, whether we should die is probably the question, isn't it? Like, you know, whether we grow old and die and that is a natural process. When we examine the creation and then say, because the creation dies, so the creation other than us I'm talking about now. So when we examine a tree or grass or an animal and we examine that creation creature and we say, that creation dies, so that means we should die. Our logic is a bit out and also does not take into account the effect we have on the creation itself. Now, through quantum physics and mechanics, we know that every time we observe something, some, it changes the way the thing works. So we know that. Now, could it be that, that because we are observing this creation and we are directly involved with this creation, that it's dying because of something in our soul? Is that not also an op a possibility? Mm. Now, if that is a possibility, instead of going, oh, creation dies, so we should, my suggestion would be go, let's have a lot more open mind than this and go, perhaps creation is dying because whatever is killing creation is also some, is the thing in us that also kills us. Mm. Perhaps that's also the problem. You know, that, that, that is the potential for it to be. That, that, that answer and, and if we had a very open mind instead of going everybody dies so it's pointless you know investigating this what we need to do I feel instead of that is we and I feel there is a compelling argument for this is we need to start seeing ourselves as the potential cause of what we see in creation so that's first my, my first argument with it the second argument I have with it is just because creatures do something it does not mean that we should so Creatures might have sex with multiple partners. Does that mean we should? Like, creatures might kill each other. Does that mean we should? Mm. Like, but an atheist would say, but that's that's the natural the natural world is yeah. full of uh, violence. The natural world is full of that sort of behaviour. And I'll say so we're beating ourselves up over over nothing. You know, this is maybe this is a natural part of being human. Uh, that I know what the atheist says, but my suggestion is what, what about the other alternative, which, which nobody seems to want to discuss very much, and that is what if we are creating this so-called natural behaviour by something that exists out of, in our soul that's out of harmony with love? Mm. What if that's the potential? Because I, I, I can see just as much of a, po a possible argument for that as the, what the atheist is saying. What about pre-human history? Well, nobody was there in pre-human history to examine what actually occurred. But don't they, don't they say that dinosaurs got cancer and um, that... But how, how can you tell whether they, something that has, has passed and decomposed like that has had cancer? Well, I guess they look at the um, calcification of bones and so forth. And make yeah, so then there's a presumption of what the underlying cause of the mm. illness might have been. Without, without there being far more information available, I don't think it's that, you, that you can accurately tell. And, you know, I feel again the reality is that many of these things that happened to his pre, so called prehistoric animals all occurred when mankind arrived on the scene 
and when mankind chose to act out of harmony with love. You say so-called prehistoric. You, do you... Yeah, I don't believe dinosaurs were prehistoric to humans. I don't. Um, no, not at all. I believe dinosaurs lived and cohabited with humans at one point in history. Well, you're really going against the scientific community <laughs> now. Well, I believe that human, human habitation on this planet has lived for, for hundreds of thousands of years. You know, we, we only have record of what, five or six thousand years, or even four thousand years. Um, you know, there are some things that, you know, the Bible suggests six thousand years, for example. Mm -hmm. But I believe we've been here hundreds of thousands of years, and I think, there's I think there's plenty of evidence for that to be the case. And there's also evidence uh, that, that the different animals coexisted with us at, during those times. And I feel the closer we brought ourselves into harmony with love, the e more easily we can coexist with everything. Uh, even right down to how an insect operates, like, it is all to do with our, our being out of harmony with love. Why does a mosquito bite us? Right, my feelings are is because there's something out of harmony with love inside of us that causes it to bite us. Now it might be just something that's out of harmony with love in the sense of how we view ourselves. Mm. But, but uh, and that's what I've noticed is that people who view themselves or attack themselves more frequently, generally those people get eaten alive by mosquitoes. People who have less self-attack generally get eaten far less by mosquitoes. That's been my general experience. Now, I feel that is another avenue that we should investigate, like the relationship between how animals and creatures around us respond to our emotion. And I believe the dinosaurs responded to our emotions in exactly Human the same way. emotions? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I feel that what's happened historically is that everything was in a symbiotic relationship before humankind arrived on the scene. Once humankind arrived on the scene, we see this, this stepping away from love inside of the human soul. And once we see that, we don't understand, and I still don't believe humans understand the power of their own soul. The power of their soul is so incredible that as soon as something is out of harmony with love in their soul, it starts to demonstrate itself in its environment. And this is what I see happening constantly around us. You, you, you can see now, one person out of harmony with love can infect an entire stadium of people. Right? So, so this tells me that there is this direct connection between the emotions of one individual and the latent or hidden emotions in whole groups of people. Now, one person in harmony with love can also affect a whole stadium of people. And I believe for the very same reason, that our souls are the sensitive things and the most powerful creator. Mm -hmm. And once we understand that, we understand the relationship between the soul and its causes, then we'll start seeing the relationship between the soul causing the environment to act in a violent way. The soul's emotion causing the physical body to react in a violent way towards itself. So you don't think that the world was ever... that the... that animals eating animals was ever... was ever designed to occur that way? No. I believe there are certain creatures like insects, what I would classify to be... Um, in, uh, creatures without a central nervous system and uh, with a central nervous system there is a capability of experiencing pain mm -hmm. without a central nervous system there all pain is localized and if there's no central nervous system there's no processing of pain so i believe that all the creatures without a central nervous system were given to the creatures with several ner central nervous systems to eat and and if we and in fact the the creatures without central nervous systems there is a historical evidence and scientific evidence that they came first in the evolutionary cycle. Now, I believe what happened was that we have these creatures evolved that, that over many periods of time came to the point where they don't, do not have central nervous systems, but they then became a food source for the next leap or the next generation of creatures, which were the creatures who developed central nervous systems and, and who also had a spirit body. And and once we see this transition occur, once this transition did occur, these animals were all capable of surviving by eating those other animals or those other creatures or by eating the vegetation that was provided already in abundance on the planet. And if you look, on, look at a normal functioning ecosystem on this planet, there are huge amounts of vegetation, huge amounts of insects and other creatures without central nervous systems, and there are far less 
amounts of creatures with central nervous systems in comparison. You know, if we look at the average yield per acre of insects compared to the average yield per acre of a mammal, mm. you'd see that you know one mammal might be in one square acre, where in one square acre there might be literally billions of billions of insects. Mm. And this is an indication, I feel, of what those animals would have normally eaten. And here in Australia, the majority of them still do normally eat those particular creatures. You know, I think there's out of out of the billion species of animals, 800,000 are insects. Yep. And they're discovering 10,000 new species every year. Yes. Yeah. Of insects. Yes. And the reality is there's so much abundance of insect life. There's so much abundance of, you know, fungus, bacterial life, and all of those kind of life. There's so much abundance of, of veg vegetable life, so much abundance in all of those areas of flora. That, and I feel that those were our primary food sources for all of the living creatures that have ever existed. Now, there are some creatures that are designed as carrion, you know, creatures, clean up creatures, uh, right from the insect, from a blowfly, for example, you know, a normal house fly, mm. right the way through to an eagle or something like that. They are all, I believe, created for the purpose of cleaning up carrion. I don't believe once we get into our pure condition of love that those animals will destroy other animals they will after the animal has died clean it up but i don't believe that they will kill the animal does that make sense mm. i do believe they have the uh, the ability to clean it up because we can see all the way through the physical universe and particularly on the earth we see this constant mechanism that seems to be present and that is this constant mechanism towards perfection, really, a mechanism cleaning up the environment and getting it back into a pristine state is constantly occurring. And if you take man out of the operation, it happens quite rapidly in hundreds of years. If you put man in the operation where we're destroying the systems, now it can take thousands or, or, of years to, to, for, for recovery to occur. Uh, I, there's an interesting thing that's worth people worth examining. I, you remember Chernobyl, the, the, um, the nuclear meltdown that occurred in Russia and Chernobyl mm. in the Ukraine. And um, in Chernobyl, um, they, they haven't had anybody there for the last 30, 30 years or 25 years or however long it is, is long now since that occurred. What they found is the animals and the birds and other creatures in there, none of the, the first generation died, uh, not all of them, but the first generation generation some of the first generation died after the after the nuclear fallout but the next generation completely survived without any effects even though their whole body was full of radiation so what they expected to occur which was you know this constant degenerative thing that would normally occur with radioactive isotopes that is not occurring and and what they've started to do is they start examining why that would be not not occurring They've actually had film crews go in there, and it's worth having a look at some of them that are on the net. And, and they've taken you know, pictures of the animals and the birds, and, and, and in fact, because there are no humans there, the animals and the birds and the wildlife are flocking into the area and multiplying in great numbers, and, uh, and yet many of them have high levels of radiation, and yet they don't get sick, and they don't die. And they live normal life. They live a normal time period as what what they would normally live outside of the zone, the the radioactive zone. And uh, you've got to start asking questions. Well, why is it that the animals in there, which are contaminated with radiation, are living like that when the animals, normally who are living with humans, who are radioactively contaminated, die within a few weeks generally? Mm. So there's got to be some relationship between the animals being with the humans and then the animals not having to be with human humanity. So there's got to be something to do with the human's emotions, the human state that's causing these relationships to occur. And I don't feel at this point that anybody's really asked, asked any questions about that, but, but these are all interesting things that we could be investigating and putting a lot more of our scientific effort into. Mm. Yeah. A lot of people these days, get, just getting back to... Um modern day health. Yep. Uh, a lot of people these days are suffering depression mm -hmm. and anxiety yep. uh, and getting sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. um, 
and getting masks put on. Mm -hmm. And every second person you know, especially men, yeah. are on antidepressants. Yeah. Um, now you have a, a spiritual explanation for this as well, or is this to do with emotions and spirit influence? Or? Well, it depends what type of depression. Um, if, we, if we look at uh, the spirit influence that occurs, all spirit influence occurs because of an emotion in the beginning anyway. So, so everything can be traced back to a cause within the person's own soul. And if, the, if it's a true child, then the cause is usually between in the parent's own soul that is causing the physical responses. So if we go back to the cause within the soul, what we start to discover with depression, and most, uh, most psychologists know this, is that a person who's depressed is generally very suppressed with rage. In other words, they have a lot of anger inside of them, who, uh, at which they don't feel capable of releasing or they don't feel safe to release. And as a result of that, they suppress their anger. And once they suppress their anger, they go into a very numb state a very detuned and numb state. Now, of course, when you go into a detuned emotional state, you are inviting lots of other external influences, including spirit influences. But if we forget that for a moment, the actual cause is the desire to suppress the emotion. And when we suppress all of our emotions, we get into depression. And when we are, in de when we are depressed, we are now living a life of suppressed emotion. In other words, all of our life is pretty much governed by how much emotion we are suppressing. Now that's classical depression. If you start looking at, say, something like manic depression, you have a cycle where you have a high, where the period the person is almost and can sometimes become psychotic in their nature, and then you have very, very extreme lows where the person becomes suicidal in, in, their, in their nature. And they seem to like the highs and they don't like the lows. Now, if you look at this cycle, there are often many spirits attached to the high base cycle of the person in a high. So, so you have a person go off medication. They normally go into this high state where they are heavily influenced by spirits. The spirits cause them to stay awake you know, 23 hours out of 24 every day. The spirits individually connect to the person and get the person to do all these different things they would not normally do. The spirits uh, feed this person with energy so they have enough energy. I, I once knew one man who was, uh, who was manically depressed and he was 65 and while he was in the high state, he could do handstands, you know, like walk around on his hands. If you asked it to do it in his low state, he couldn't even move his body to get into a hand press position. So, you know, on the high state, he could walk around on his hands, and that's an indication of how much energy he was being pumped full mm -hmm. of through some kind of connection with the spirit world, with spirits. Then the spirits after a while cannot maintain, the physical body cannot maintain that amount of energy. And so what happens is the spirit, the, the physical body, once it gets to a certain point, can no longer maintain the connection with the spirits. And at that point is the point when the person goes into a severe down. They go through what we would call normal life and into major depression, suicidal depression. And, uh, and that's usually when they go to get some medication. The medication makes them stable. And then usually after they've been stable for a while, they go off the medication because they don't like its side effects and then back up into the high cycle again, predictable as ever, generally. Now, that particular cycle, manic depression, I feel, is still caused by some underlying emotions in the soul of the individual that they are trying to avoid. They are trying to avoid certain things in their life that, uh, and you know, this is where I feel this, this psycho psychology can assist understanding what they're trying to avoid. And, and also their desire to have this high life, this life where they feel like they're full of energy and they feel like they're powerful and they feel like they're invincible. They want that, many of them. And many of those people who are uh, medicated to, with, with antidepressants hate being medicated because it takes them away from that invincible feeling that they had when they were in their high. Mm. That high feeling is connected to spirits. 
the low feeling they are being themselves connected to some of their own emotions that they do not want to feel they'd rather die than feel those emotions what we need to do is teach people who are depressed how to feel their emotions in a loving way that's compassionate to them that's not full of judgments and many of these people will become well if we do that but society as a whole expects equilibrium we do not like to see a person crying even a little mm. and we do not like people experiencing fear even a little and if a person is feeling crying fear crying fear we call that out of sync with the normalcy and then what we do is we judge that and then we pump them full of a drug to get them back into normal life none of them feel normal you talk to every one of them none of them feel normal mm. but uh, but the rest of us are happy because they appear normal because whenever they get into that crying it reminds us of our tears whenever they get into their fear it reminds us how we are afraid we are we don't like to be reminded of those things and so we like everybody to maintain the status quo so if we look at uh, depression suppression of rage and anger uh, and other emotions because under rage and anger are the other emotions of fear and you know mm. and sadness if we look at manic depression suppression of rage and anger same emotion and a willingness to die rather than feel but also an addiction to get being high an addiction to being invincible an addiction to feeling powerful which is an avoidance of a uh, emotion of being powerless Let's look at schizophrenia, another so-called mental illness. Schizophrenia, the person is plagued by voices. Now, the medical profession calls them voices that you know are constructed in their own mind through some kind of psychotic uh, episode. I can't agree. They are voices from spirits who these people are open to speaking with and these spirits come and torment them because they're able to. And if the person understood why there's the attraction, we could help them greatly. Often schizophrenia, particularly when it's young, has an onset from some kind of drug use. You know, some kind, sometimes it's marijuana, sometimes it's a mixture of other drugs, and that causes an onset of schizophrenia in some younger persons. This is because spirits are attracted to drug users. Spirits in the spirit world who would still like to have, you know, get away from their own feelings and emotions, will attract people on earth who are trying to get away from their own feelings and emotions. So schizophrenia it, and hearing all of these voices, the voices telling them what to do, some of the things that voices tell them are very, very damaging to their life, all caused by firstly the avoidance of an emotion, causing a, causing a desire to, or an openness to spirit communication. And there's nothing wrong with spirit communication. But when the spirits around you are telling you to kill yourself or to kill other people, now there's an issue mm. and we, we would need to address that. And if, we, and if we were addressing the actual cause, we'd be having cures of schizophrenia. The reality is we're not address, addressing actual causes and that's why we only have management of schizophrenia on the planet. Mm. We don't have cure. So um, your solution is basically let's feel our emotions be open to our emotions work through them and that's the best answer to these health issues uh, not just that remember i'm referring every emotion to the aspect of love you see just because you work through an emotion let's say you've got an emotion of anger inside of you you might feel the emotion of anger and express the emotion of anger inside of you but in the end the anger has an underlying cause that's a demand like it has some kind of demand that's inside of you that you feel you should get something and you haven't got it and that's why you're angry, right? So, so there's an unlovingness inside of the person who gets angry. There's a cause for their anger. And we, what we need to do is take it back to the loving cause of, or, you know, the unloving cause of all illness. illness. You know, it's always an unloving cause, but we need to get it back to love as well. So it's not just a matter of feeling the emotion. We have to understand emotion and truthful emotions based upon love compared to untruthful emotions that are based upon you know, error, based upon fear, based upon rage or anger and other kinds of emotions like that. And we need to be able to feel both but identify and get back to love as being the underlying healer. Now, once, once we understand that love heals everything, 
we will start to understand that any illness that's inside of my, myself is only caused by something that's out of harmony with love. And so I need to understand it's not just about emotion. It's about whether the emotion has a basis in love or not. If the emotion has a basis in love, it will always heal us. If the emotion has a basis that's out of harmony with love, it will always cause our disease, whether we feel the emotion or not. So we need to understand love as well as emotion. Mm. But, but to do that, we have to allow emotion. You know, obviously we need to allow emotion, but, but we also need to understand the difference between a love-based emotion and an emotion that's out of harmony with love as, as its underlying intention. Mm. Yeah. And that's where I feel the majority of people will come to grief with emotional work. Yeah. Now, listening to a, um, getting, getting on to this uh, conundrum that I was referring to earlier, um, you teach people what loving behaviour is, but at the same time you say, well, I don't feel that you're there because you haven't accepted it emotionally. Um, so we can teach people what love is, but until they actually feel it, it's not a reality. It doesn't. It's is it a, is it a waste of time teaching turn the other cheek to somebody who is incapable inside of turning the other cheek? Um, I don't know if it's a waste of time, Jeff, um, because basically I feel we go through levels of awareness. We usually start with some kind of intellectual form of awareness before we actually get to some kind of emotional resolution or awareness. And so, so I don't believe saying something is actually, um, you know, not helpful. Mm -hmm. However, saying something is not going to be long term helpful unless there is some kind of emotional awareness that results in the end. So, so for example, we, we need to have a for you to become aware of your soul, you know, let's say you're not aware of your soul, and for you to become aware of your soul, you'd have to have some kind of discussion with a person intellectually where they talk about the concept of the soul. Right? And then you start this process of intellectually pondering, yes? You start thinking about that. You know, maybe there is this thing called the soul. I don't really know, you know, I don't really have any proof, but I don't have any proof that it's not there either. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, maybe it's something that I need to investigate. So as you start allowing yourself to investigate, you can see that your intellect is now being opened. So I do feel, and I would call that having an intellectual awareness of what the truth may be. Now, I don't feel that's ever harmful. I feel that's always a good thing, that somebody has an intellectual truth, you know, awareness of what the truth may be. So, so when somebody asks me, would love do this? I, I feel uh, that I must respond to their question. Yes, love would do this, or no, love would not do this. Now, that doesn't mean that they understand what I'm saying at this point. It just means that their intellect has been challenged into a, in, a, in a state where they might become aware. However, as you correctly point out, until that feeling is in their heart, it will not be truth for them. And so we've got to look at what causes the truth to get into the heart and also what causes opposition for the truth getting into the heart before the truth can actually enter us. And that's where I feel the unloving emotions that are present within our soul cause a lot of opposition. So for example, if we examine the emotion of fear, let's say you are afraid of public opinion. Let's say that was your, your fear. If you are afraid of public opinion, anything I say to you that might confront your fear of public opinion, it's highly likely you will reject because you'll be more afraid of public opinion than you will be of not knowing the truth about that particular subject. Right? And, so, and so your fear of public opinion will govern what you accept. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm, if I'm so afraid of public opinion that you might tell me something that disagrees with what the general public believe, I'm going to immediately dismiss that. Right? unless I'm aware that I am afraid of public opinion. Mm. And if I'm at least intellectually aware that I'm afraid of public opinion, I'll go, okay, 
I want to reject what Jeff's saying, but I know that I'm afraid of public opinion, and I know the public all would agree with me wanting to reject what Jeff's saying, so maybe I'm rejecting what Jeff is saying just because of what everybody else thinks, and maybe that's something I need to address. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, once I have that level of intellectual awareness, I now have the ability, if I so choose, to delve into that fear, to actually start allowing myself to feel this fear of public opinion. A great way for me to do that would be to start expressing some of the things that, that you were expressing to another person who I knew had a completely opposite viewpoint, and to feel the fear of their judgment or their criticism or their rage even. And then go, oh, that's the fear that I can have it, that, that I've got inside of me that's causing me to reject Jeff's, you know, proposition. Now, you can see that this process begins with an intellectual awareness of the potential of the emotion existing within, and then a willingness, which I would call humility, a willingness to go into the emotion itself and to actually feel it and to become emotionally aware of it. And then a willingness to feel it. And if I have a willingness to feel it, then the emotion will be released from me. And now when you say something to me that the public generally doesn't accept, I'll go, that's a very interesting proposition. And I'll be much more open to investigating the truth of it mm. than I would have been before. And so I feel the majority of people resist truth for one reason. And that is, they have emotions in their soul that prevent them from being open to the possibility of it being the truth. That's the only reason why they reject it. Why does a racist reject that all of us are equal? Because he has an emotion within him that prevents him from having an ability to accept that proposition. Mm. Why, why does a sexist, you know, a male chauvinist, reject that women are as good as he is because he has an emotion inside of his soul that causes him to instantly reject that what is a logical well, we've proposition. We've seen these attitudes change, evolve over the, they have. the last couple of generations. Yep. So we're actually improving somewhat there, aren't we? We are. We are. Um, you don't think that a lot of these uh, attitudes are just simply learnt from parents? And that now that we're in a different environment, we're getting more information mm. that intellectually um, it's having an effect. Well, no, I feel it's more, if you look at the psychology of learning even, we can see that it would actually be traced back to emotions. Like, for example, if the previous generation of people no longer have any feeling of racism inside of them, then when they give birth to the next generation of people, the next generation of people have no idea or concept of racism inside of them. As a result of that, they will never be a racist. Does that make sense? When they grow up, they will never be a racist. And, and this is, I feel, because each generation does a little bit of work on these areas of inequality. Now, for example, at the moment, a hot topic is, is the topic of you know, marriage for homosexuals, for example. This is an area that very little people on the planet have yet to really deal with mm. because there are huge areas of the planet, most religions for example, huge areas of the planet do not believe that homosexual relationships have any valid validity, right? But it's going to take exactly the same process where each generation has more and more acceptance until we get to the point where one generation has more acceptance of a homosexual union than rejection of it. And after that point, the next generation of people who are on the planet will actually feel not judged whether they are homosexual or heterosexual. There will be, it won't matter anymore. Mm. Now, for that to occur, you can see that it's not just intellectual. There's emotions being transmitted to every single new generation. So every child that is being born has a whole set of emotions that it learns through its emotional experience before it's seven years of age generally from its parents and environment. And, and this is before the development of the intellect has actually occurred. In fact, many uh, priests used to say, you give me a child for the first three years of its life and I'll give you a convert for the rest of the life. 
mm. you know, because of this issue that they saw that if you could have a child for a few years and teach them certain things emotionally, they'll, they'll find it very, very hard to give it up later on in life for all sorts of reasons. And the same occurs in the positive direction. You know, if we actually positively educate our children emotionally, because remember, the way our children are learning up until the age of seven is dominantly emotional. This is what causes the change. Now, we have the capacity in this generation to decide that we can all do it on all these different issues of love. And therefore, the next generation could be completely different. And in fact, the generation, two generations down the track, could be such that they would never even conceive that women and men were not equal. Mm. <laughs> or they would never even conceive that homosexual couples shouldn't be married if they didn't want to be. Mm. If they wanted to be, sorry. And they'd never conceive that there's such a thing as racism. <laughs> you know, they wouldn't even think it possible. Mm. And, and the reason why they wouldn't think it possible is because the emotions inside of them are now are far more logical in the sense that the emotional impediment to them understanding the truth is no longer present. Mm. It's the emotional impediment inside of our soul that causes the resistance to any new truth. So the only reason why homosexual marriages are not generally accepted on this planet at this point in time is because of the emotional impediment in the majority of heterosexual people. Mm. That's the only reason why. Mm. And, uh, and, and we need to address that because we have emotional blockage in that area and we need to ask ourselves why. That emotional blockage is also present in religion, as you know. Mm. The majority of Christian religion, the majority of Muslim religion, the majority of most religions, in fact, Buddhism included, have a rejection of homosexual couple. And so therefore, it's obviously a reflection. These religions are a reflection of our own unhealed emotional state. And this is showing us that if we heal, we find out what the point of resistance is and we heal that, then we'll be able to be logical. You know, mm. we'll, for the first time, in fact, be able to be logical. Yeah. Actually, logically reason on a subject of equality, for example. Just looking at the Amish family that I was talking about, mm -hmm. um, they grew up a bit of background. Uh, well, Amish people. Uh, I mean, for basically, people who are listening. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, basically, uh, we know that Amish have a very, very strict code of conduct mm -hmm. in their home rule. Mm -hmm. um, these people are taught and indoctrinated into a certain way of behaving. Mm -hmm. And they actually learn to live it. Uh, some of it. Some of it causes problems, but some of it they learn to live. Mm -hmm. My conundrum is, you know, with teach, as being a teacher, how much benefit is teaching people about love uh, as opposed to showing them love? You know, where you, where you, can only, you can't say to a kid, be nice. They can't be nice if they're not nice. No. no. You can't say to a kid, I want you to apologise to her. Exactly. Like it's like saying to Alan Jones, go and apologise to the Prime Minister. <laughs> you know, if it's if it's not in his heart, then the apology is not worth a thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but um, Alan Jones is capable of learning things intellectually, as well as emotionally. Um, I'm just just in that conundrum there of how, you know, well, what my beliefs are this. You cannot teach love without, without feeling love. So many people believe that love is something that is a, like a principle that can be intellectually taught. I don't believe that's the case at all. Love is something that comes from your heart. It is a, an emotion in itself. A, a person, a child, cannot be taught to do something loving without there being an emotion mm. in the child of wanting to actually be loving. And, uh, and this is where I feel most of our teaching fails mm. because we, we are not actually, when, when a religious society, for example, teaches their children to follow some kind of path, they're not teaching them love, they're teaching them what I would call rote learning through the intellect. They are also teaching them that if they break away from the particular faith that their parents were in, that they'll be you know, punished for such a deed. Usually excommunicated is usually the result. Now, those teachings are a lack of love. They're not love. Mm. They're a lack of love because a love would accept 
I would accept you choosing to do anything you wish, with the exception of one thing, and that is if you chose to harm me, I wouldn't accept it. I'd just fall over and say, do it again. I would actually, you know, generally I'd try to want to um, ask you why you did it. Is there something that I offended you with or mm -hmm. something? And then if that wasn't the case and, and you still wanted to do it, I'd say, well, I'd try to walk away. Now, if I couldn't walk away, if I couldn't get away from you, then I would sit there and take it, mm. to be honest. So in other words, if I was in prison and I couldn't get away, then I would sit there and take it. Uh, because I could not certainly act unlovingly in return back mm. to you. And do but the you've often um, told people in your company that they are not acting lovingly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an intellectual judgment on your part. Um, it's not a judgment, because a judgment is an emotion. So I'm not judging them. No. I don't feel that they are lesser than I am because there are some times when I act unlovely, mm. right? And there are, are you not getting them, are you not wanting them to live up to an expectation that you have of a certain code of behaviour in, no. that, in that situation? No, because the feeling I have is I don't have any intellectual expectation of them. What I'm doing though is I'm trying to help them become aware of what loving or unloving behaviour is. And I feel the only way you can actually do that is to say, see what you just did then, mm -hmm. that was unloving for this reason. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to help them in their mind put together a linkage between what's unloving behaviour and, and at least for them to consider that that might have been unloving for this particular logical reason. What they do with that, I feel, is then up to themselves. Like, like it's not none of my business actually what they do with that information. I'm just hopefully prevent, and many of them, these people have asked me to do that, of course. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that because they've asked me to do it. They ask me some, for some feedback, I give them some feedback, but I'm not expecting them to live up to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I would like to see, but it's not an expectation, what I would like to see is for them to get to the underlying emotional reason why they chose that behaviour, whatever the reason was. And usually the reason is fear-based or a resistance to grief, or a resistance to fear, or a resistance to anger. Generally, that's the, you know, the, 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 the primary resistances, if you like. I don't Should have... you be allowing them to just express their free will? Um, they're allowed, to, as far as I'm concerned, they're completely allowed to express their free will. They are allowed to be unloving if they what desire. What about children? When you're raising children, where yeah. do you draw the line between them expressing their free will and you restricting them because of what they're doing to their... Well, I draw the line with everybody the same as I draw the line with children. It's the same line. Mm. And this is the line. Uh, and when a person is out of harmony with ethical behaviour, in other words, when the person is treating another person in, the, in a way that they themselves would not like to be treated, then they are out of harmony with the primary viewpoint of eth ethics. Now, I feel under those circumstances, that is the time when we must speak up. We must say something because a person is not being ethical in their relationship with another person. And that applies whether they're a child or an adult. In addition, if a person continues to act in an unloving manner towards another person, and particularly if that manner becomes violent, then the person who becomes violent needs to be restricted, whether they are a child or whether they are an adult. They need to have the same restriction. I don't believe there's a need to be a different restriction. Of course, the amount of power needed to in, in, you know, handle the restriction will depend upon how big the person is. So how does a parent restrict a child from just yelling out some horrible names to, an, to their sister? Well, what I've found uh, is the best form of restriction for any, for any person to engage in is just to hold the child every time they act out of harmony with love. Just to hold the child and just restrict them from, from they were allowed to speak or do anything, but take them into a room or whatever and just hold the child mm -hmm. and just talk to them about why you're holding them. And now to do that, a parent's got to be pretty engaged. The, mm -hmm. person, the parent's got to be pretty connected with themselves. They're not doing it out of rage and then the parent isn't doing it out of rage or anger or any unjust injustice or anything like that. They're just doing it because the person was unloving. Right? 
and they just hold the child and let the child have their tantrum for as long as it takes. Now sometimes I've seen it take a couple of hours. You let the child have their tantrum and you just physically restrict the child until the child gets into the grief associated with their behaviour. When they do that, you can feel the change in the child, where the, ch the child acknowledges their own unloving behaviour. But the other question I would ask myself is, if these are children and I'm the parent, I must have a look at the imbalances that are occurring in the family that are causing one child to express violently towards another. So, for example, if a male child is verbally abusing a female child, then I would have to firstly look at, firstly, my own actions towards the, you know, the, the boy and my own actions towards the girl. I would look at my own actions towards the boy and going, okay, have my actions shown him that he's allowed to verbally abuse women and get, and get away with them? So that's the first thing I'd ask myself. Now, if the answer to that was no, I have never acted in that way and I don't even feel that way, then I would ask myself, do I have a favouritism towards women? Because if I have a favouritism towards women, my child will feel the imbalance of love coming out of me towards my, his sister, my daughter, in comparison to him, my son. And therefore, he will express that generally in rage if he doesn't know how to feel that emotionally, if he doesn't know how to grieve. So what I would do then is I go, okay, do I have a favouritism towards my, the daughter in comparison to the son? Is there a, do we, or does any other member of the family who is an adult in particular have the same favouritism? If they do, we need to address that emotion because that emotion creates an imbalance that demonstrates to him that he is lesser mm. in our eyes than she is, which would naturally cause him to react in an angry manner, angry manner. That all being said, I would address those emotions and I would explain all of that to him, but I would still hold him, right? until he's realised that his behaviour towards his sister was unloving. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm. Now, when I do that, I'm not being violent towards him, but I am restricting him from expressing his, his unloving behaviour and damaging another, and also damaging himself when he does so. Now, of course, if the person is grown up, then I would have to perhaps mm. restrict them by putting them in a location mm. rather than you know, restricting them physically. Uh, you know, obviously it depends upon how big the person is as to how well I can carry out that piece of advice. But I do not believe that a child is any different than an adult when it comes to the expression of violence. So in other words, whatever the person, whoever the person is, whether a child or an adult, we need to restrict the expression of violence. Whenever violence is expressed, there is always going to be damaging results unless there is a restriction placed on, upon the violent person. However, I also need to look at how has their violence been triggered by my general attitude. So, for example, many um, gay people have expressed violence towards others and many people have expressed violence towards gay people. Many heterosexual people have experienced violence towards gay people. You can see, after many centuries and millennia of actually gay people being treated in a violent and deprecating manner, that there's going to be some kind of rebellious kickback for that kind of treatment. And so it's logical to, if we see somebody acting out of harmony with love, that we, it's logical for us to question how have I contributed to their pain that causes them to be out of harmony with love. And it's very logical for me to ask myself that question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I believe that it requires both of those actions mm -hmm. if we're truly going to heal the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess we'd better start finishing up. So the last question, uh, with people with illnesses who, uh, like people who are ageing, mm -hmm. who are getting Alzheimer's, um, losing their cognitive ability, mm -hmm. do they pass into the spirit world with that same impairment? Yes, if we examine uh, so-called age-onset disease, uh, and all diseases of many, you know, many types are all triggered uh, or seem to be exacerbated by age. The reason why is that the longer we go denying the underlying soul-based emotion that exists, the, the more physical problems will be present in our bodies, both our spirit and physical bodies. Now, if one of the physical things that we are attempting to do with our soul, our emotions, is to not remember some of our life because we're ashamed of it or we feel guilty about it, or, or we'd like to forget it because it was traumatic, 
then of course we have it, our emotion coming from our soul is forget this part, forget this part, forget this part. Now the older we get, the easier it is to forget those parts often. And as a result, we, we go into this place where we're actually shutting down parts of our brain that would cause the memory of those particular parts of our life. And, and this is one of the main causes of things like Alzheimer's, a desire to forget certain parts of a, of a person's life. Of course, God made us in such a way that we can't forget certain parts without forgetting whole parts of our life. And unfortunately, um, you know, uh, we don't have as a good a selective ability to remember as what many people believe. And as a result of that, we often finish up shutting down a lot of our cognitive ability. That our ability is all braced around our brain and what our brain will do for us. As a, as a result of these particular problems, we, we finish up developing a, a, a great distance between the true emotional condition that we have, our emotional memories, if you like, and what we would like to remember. Now, if we do that while we're on Earth and then we pass, we will actually arrive in the spirit world in the same state of not wanting to remember our life. But if you had a, if you had a retarded cognitive ability, then you're not going to be able to work through these emotions, are you? If you, you, you... No, we need to go through this process of understanding that the retarded cognitive ability is not caused, in the case that we're bringing up here, is, is not uh, created by anything other than the emotion. In other words, the emotion came first. Mm. And we have, we don't need the, the ability to use our mind in order to feel an emotion. You look at a child, a two-year-old child, which has very little intellectual capacity, is fully capable of experiencing emotion. Right? And this is something that is a, a good thing about our life. If we remove cognitive ability, eventually the person starts becoming more emotional which is actually the healing part of their cognitive ability. Mm. Does that make sense? And this is why many people who are, in, uh, who are aged go through many, many you know, up and down emotions. And unfortunately, the medical profession, of course, tries to suppress that. But it's better to not suppress that if possible. It's better to allow this to occur because this is a part of the natural way our soul heals itself. We need to understand that when we get to the point where we're no longer cognizant of what's happening in our life, and we have many different emotions fluctuating in the course of the day. These are our emotions that we should have been expressing before and have not been, which are the reason for our lack of cognitive ability. Mm. And if we re let the emotions release, our a cognitive ability would return. Uh, the unfortunate thing of what we generally do, though, under these circumstances, is we medicate the person we cause them to be in a stable place emotionally, which causes their ability to heal to be suppressed. And now they cannot, cannot be healed until they die. Once they die and they pass into the spirit world, there is no drugs that they can use to suppress their emotion. So now their emotions begin to flow. They're, and these emotions are partly, are all going to contribute to the healing of their cognitive ability. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so, so the way God's designed the system is so that if we don't interfere with it too much, it, it naturally heals itself. The way we, we view things is we go, oh, we want the person to be stable. And so we suppress the flow of emotion that seems to be extreme. And as a result of that, we suppress the ability to heal. And, uh, and unfortunately, many people who have done that, who, who pass in a, in a non-cognitive uh, you know, state, they arrive in the spirit world and they are overwhelmed with emotion, many of them, for many, many years, and then they start to have a, rem a remembrance of what happened as a result. And that is a part of the natural healing function of the soul. The soul is always going to, to be drawn to its natural state, which is to fully express its emotion. Mm. That's its natural state. The soul will always be drawn to that state. Whether we're interested in a relationship with God or not, we will be drawn to that state in the future. Now, if we're not interested in a relationship with God, we don't have anything driving it, so we might have a lot of resistance to it, but we will still be drawn to it. 
sooner or later the soul will draw us to this healing place where we have to feel emotion to heal. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's probably a good place to finish. Yeah. Uh, interesting question. Yeah. Thanks <laughs> once again. <laughs> yeah. I've, still got, I've still got plenty more questions. <laughs> Wait for another time. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, thanks for your time too, coming out. Oh, pleasure. Through our drive there and back. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you for a nice meal and a nice uh, visit again. All right, so we'd like to thank our two videographers, Lena and Igor. Have a smile at the camera's going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jeff's sister came, came with him today. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, uh, and Mary. You had a question too, did you, Doug? Well, I did, somewhere in the middle so of that. Somewhere in the middle of that, did you? Um, but you've kind of answered it, um, or almost answered it, but it was just to do with more elaboration upon um, how to process the emotion of fear. The, the problem, Del, with asking how to process an emotion is we start engaging our mind too much in the process of feeling an emotion. The, if you look at the way a child uh, processes any emotion. Mm. They never ask an adult, Mummy, how do I feel my fear? Yeah, yeah. Do they? Yeah. What do they do instead? They just... They, do, they be, yeah. They, they just start they trembling be, yes. and frightened and you can see them curl up and they're frightened. They just yeah. let themselves be the emotion. Yeah. And, and uh, the general answer to how to experience any emotion is to let yourself be that emotion. Um, that's what a child automatically does. And that's why one of the reasons why I said, you know, you must become as a little child to enter the kingdom of heavens. Because partly the child has, has this state of humility, which we as an adult unlearn. And the state of humility of the child is the child desires to, to just be whatever they are at the time, if they are allowed to be. Yes, and I, I can see, well, you answered part of it because I can see you when you're talking about the love, it comes back to the love part of it and I was thinking, oh, okay, well, what, to me, that, what that comes back to is the non-judgmental. Yes. So whatever feelings you're feeling, you're, you will suppress it to the point that you are judging it and when you're not judging it, you will allow it to, it's, you allow it to flow. So you yes. kind of answered it. Uh, but, but there's more to that with the love question because we need to understand God's perspective of what the loving thing in this particular situation would be. For, for, if I can give you an example, when a, when a child feels an emotion, are we running out? Are we? No, no, no. We're good. Um, unless a child feels, uh, let's say a child feels an emotion of anger. Now we need to allow the child to express this emotion of anger, right? When they express the emotion of anger, we're not allowing them, we wouldn't allow them to, to hurt somebody else with it. So we, we'd restrict them, perhaps, so that they couldn't hurt anybody, including themselves, and just let them express their emotion of anger, scream, yell, carry on, whatever. They'll pass through that emotion, then they'll find the next emotion, which is, which is usually sadness. So they'll go into their grief, right? For a child, they would normally skip through any fear that was present straight into the grief most yeah. of the time. And now they're just crying, 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 experiencing their sadness, right? They're not choosing to feel anything at this point, and they still haven't found out why they're sad necessarily. They're just feeling their sadness. Yeah. The next step, if we're truly going to have, be loving, is to understand whether that sadness was a loving state or not. Okay. Now, what I mean by that is, if the child was sad because it was denied a lolly... Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, I can see where you're going with this. It's to do with the demand. You it's really in sensation. demand. Yeah. Right? Or and something in a particular way for yourself. Exactly. Yeah. And so the sadness is not a sadness that is going to help them come to the truth. Yeah. It's a sadness that's going to help them stay in their error. So we need to help them go further than this. And we need to help them see that actually their demand for a lolly was unloving. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And then we need to understand also, if they're a child, uh, if we're holding a child, we need to understand well, why did they feel so unloved when they didn't get the lolly? Yeah. So we need to, as a parent, now ask ourselves that question, because yes. obviously we had some kind of bartering system with these lollies yeah. that caused them to feel loved. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so we need to help the child go further than just releasing the emotion. It has to go into this place where it understands the truth. If I'm denied a lolly, it's, it doesn't mean that I'm not loved. Yeah, yeah. And 
And so relating that then to an adult processing fear. Yes. Um, can you explain that a little bit further? As in, um, what, what's the, um, you said go further than the... Well, let, let's look at it. So, 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 so let's, say I'm, let's, let's say I'm terrified of public opinion. So I'm absolutely terrified of public opinion. So, so as an adult, that could cause me to, let's say I'm presented with an opportunity to speak to a group of people there, an audience. And as an adult, I start to go, whoa, that, you know, that's very scary. I, and most adults would just go, I'm definitely not doing that. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if they were truly desirous of experiencing their fear, they would allow themselves to agree to actually speak to the audience. And then they would concentrate on feeling their feelings about that. So feeling the panic, breathing, feeling the panic that's rising, you know, all those, all those emotions, just like a child. They just <coughs> allow themselves to experience all of that. And then once they felt all the fear, they may actually get to some grief, just like a child would. Grief about being publicly humiliated as a child, about, you know, oftentimes as a child, we have been publicly humiliated, you know, in all sorts of circumstances and situations in order to control our, you know, direction or life we'd probably connect with some of those feelings. Once we've released that, we would then have to come to this point, is it, is it terrifying to actually speak to a group of people? And we'd actually get to a point from God's perspective, we'd see from God's perspective, that it's not terrifying to speak to a million people, yeah. let alone 10 or 20. Right? And so that would be God's perspective of love. And if I, would, I would understand then if I'm in a pure state of love, I would not be frightened of speaking to anyone, ever. No matter how large the group, no matter how violent the group, no matter how you know, loving the group, I would, still, I would still be able to speak to people. Right? Now that is the state of truth, and if I'm not there yet, I know there must be another emotion stopping me from accepting that state of truth. But, yeah. Um, yeah, just to add to that, something that I've found is it, it's helpful to have the intellect involved with fear if if I um, if I was say in the example that you have whenever I come up against something that I know I'm afraid of but intellectually I can see the truth is something different mm -hmm. then I just have to act in opposition with the fear that's how I it's hard whenever people say how do you process fear mm -hmm. uh, rather than saying a methodology I just feel if we act to challenge the fear every time, we begin to process, we don't have to think, how do I feel afraid? Because our action is challenging the fear, it automatically starts coming out of us, mm -hmm. as long as we are willing in that process. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. see, like AJ said, with the, um, with the public speaking, I go, okay, I know I'm terrified, uh, I know my fear is saying, don't do this thing, but intellectually I can see this is just, mm -hmm. this is just a bunch of people, so I'll act to challenge this fear, act in opposition to the message of the fear. And then when you're standing up in front of those people and you have that fear, it starts coming out of you, yeah. you know, and you start to receive, as fear comes out of you, you start to receive a new truth almost pretty quickly, okay. whether it's to feel the grief that's underneath it or just the fact that, oh, this is, this Something thing I'm really afraid of yeah. is, even when it does happen sometimes, the thing I'm afraid of, Oh, oh, but I can survive it. I don't, I don't have the same level of fear associated with it. Yeah. It might uncover the grief when what I fear to happen does happen, but it's not that same, I can't go there mm. thing. Can I suggest that? But it's a lot, it is a lot more um, difficult than I feel Mary is stating. Because, totally. because the reality... <laughs> oh, <sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that, that fear... Um, is a dominant emotion. So for example, if you got up and spoke to a group uh, that you were terrified of speaking to, you might just stand there and just stare at them and, and not be able to say anything. Yeah. Now that might be your very first experience of fear, which, which I would call terror, and that's like stunned terror, yeah. <laughs> like where you're just so locked up, you're just frozen. Now, my suggestion there would be, you'd probably go through a cycle then of now, we, and this is where it would be important if the group was not judgmental and they just said, Oh, 
you know, Dell's in a very stunned place at this moment. So we'll just let her be stunned. And if there's anybody else who can talk, you know, and yeah. if everybody just sort of was pretty relaxed about yeah. it, you would probably consider doing it again. Yeah. But if everybody was judgmental, think, oh, what a stupid woman that was, you know, she just stunned, you know, why did why get her off the stage? And, you know, they had all this emotion coming in. Then, then it would be a, you know, you'd be even more traumatized by the experience probably and be even more stunned the next time. Yeah. So this is where I feel love has to also be involved in the process of experiencing an emotion. It's no good, it's no good placing yourself in a situation that's fear-based, uh, you know, that's challenging your fear, only for you to be treated worse mm -hmm. as a result. It's, challenge your fear when you know you're going to be placed in a place that's, you know, that where either before, during, or afterwards you're going to be able to feel mm -hmm. the underlying emotion. That that would be the wiser thing to do. You can't always do that because the law of attraction will bring you situations yeah. where your fear will be challenged instantly. But you need to also learn that you're allowed to experience that emotion right in in the situation as well. So it will take sometimes like with fear it can take two three months of solidly working at something to become over it. You won't it won't happen in one sitting. But it, uh, if you don't address it at all, you'll carry around that fear the rest of your life. Mm. You'll never speak publicly again. You, you'll never, you know, you, you, you'll severely limit your, the potential of your life through that one particular problem. So, so I sort of feel like the process is a matter of confronting the emotion, as Mary said, through action. But don't expect to have it all over and done within one sitting because that's not normally how our you know, soul-based emotional situation works. The way the soul works is we let out as much as we feel capable of letting out at the time. I feel though a lot of times we judge even that and we restrict how much we're capable of letting out. Mostly because we're worried about how everyone else will think of us yeah. as well, again. So if we're in an environment where you could cry whenever you wanted, so just before, remember when we were having a conversation with Jeff <coughs> at the dinner table when you started mentioning that uh, movie, mm -hmm. some of the emotion was starting to come up with you. And if you felt like you were in an environment where you could just have a good sob, mm -hmm. you would have just had a good sob again, you know. And, and that's what we want to create. We want to create uh, an environment where everybody in the environment feels, I'm allowed to have a cry if I need to have a cry. And I'm allowed to go out and bash the punching bag if I need to have a bash, you know, uh, without anybody judging me and saying how crazy I am. Um, and I need to shake and feel my fear if I need to feel my fear. Um, I feel this is a very important thing with regard to conditioning that we've had on the planet. Like, we've conditioned each new generation to become less sensitive to emotion than the last by imposing all of these rules upon what is normal behavior. If we all viewed normal behavior as, as a child expressing its emotion, we don't view violence as normal. At the moment, we all view violence as normal, ironically, and yet, and yet we don't view expressing emotion as normal. But it's sort of like upside down. We need to see that the expression of violence in any way, whether it's yelling, screaming at a person, berating them, pulling them down, being condescending to them, belittling to them, right the way through to physical violence, physical harm and murder and, and uh, war, these are, if we saw all of these things as unacceptable and, and behaviour worth restricting, and, and we saw the emotional expression of grief, fear, terror, anger, as, as, a, as the ability to be free and express our emotions freely without damaging another person, the entire thing would be completely reversed. At the moment, what we're getting is we get the complete suppression of emotion, almost. No, not allowed to feel grief too much, otherwise you're depressed. Not allowed to feel angry too much, otherwise you're in a rage. Not allowed to feel happy too much, otherwise you're crazy. Not allowed to feel fear too much, because otherwise you look strange. And that's our suppression. And then, and then we wonder why we have violence, war, you know, expression of rage occurring unchecked on a daily basis. And the reason why we have all of that is because we're suppressing the emotion. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question.
<laughs> Thanks, guys, for coming. Thank you. Thank you.